The, uh, the title of the sermon today is True Love is Eternal. It's part one uh, from 1 Corinthians 13. And Winston will do the scripture reading for us. Yes, Paul's description of love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. There's a lot said about love in God's word. It's such a deep and subject that it would take many, many sermons to cover it. And then we would not cover it fully because God is love and he is, he is, we can apprehend him but we cannot fully understand him. He's, he's so great, he's eternal. How can we understand eternity as human beings? It's something that uh, just blows our mind just thinking about that. But the Holy Spirit has been given to the church as a gift. And Jesus told the apostles before his death that the Holy Spirit was with them, but that he would be in them. And when he, when he walked the earth, uh, Jesus uh, walked, he set aside his divinity, he walked on the earth as a man. And the, the apostles and the disciples could see Jesus, but when Jesus was in a different place, he was with them, but he was not in them. The promise that Jesus gave before ascending to heaven, before his crucifixion, was a tremendous gift, a tremendous promise, because he promised that God would be with us all the time. And since God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God is one, when the person of the Holy Spirit dwells in us, God dwells in us. The Father dwells in us. Jesus lives in, dwells in us as well. And so, the, the Holy Spirit was sent from God through Jesus. And when God opens our minds through the Holy Spirit, we know we have direct access to the throne of God in Christ Jesus. It's, before that, we, we don't know. We think we have to qualify. We think that we go before the throne of God on our own. But the fact is, is once God reveals who he is and how he works and Jesus came to reveal himself and the Holy Spirit certainly came to uh, give us these wonderful truths, we know that when we pray, we can pray with assurance because our high priest Jesus brings our prayers and we participate in his ongoing prayer. So when we pray, we participate in a prayer that's already going on. And Jesus prays for all of us. He's our great shepherd. He's our high priest. He's our perfect representative in heaven, being both God and man. So being, as human beings, we have been given this enormous gift of being able to love. 
But the fact is you cannot express godly love apart from God dwelling in us. In Romans 5, verse 5, it says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And I know sometimes people say that the Holy Spirit, they're still, I was, sometimes I get questions about the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is a power. But you'll notice that in the translation it doesn't say through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. It refers to a who, to a person, to God himself. And the love of God is very different than the love of human beings because it's completely unselfish. It's completely outgoing. And human love is described in many places. You can check in dictionaries. I checked one, the uh, dictionary.com. It says it defines love as a profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person. It describes love as a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, child, or friend, sexual passion or desire. A person to, towards whom love is felt, beloved person, sweetheart. And uh, so the list, it even lists the love affair, uh, and that is human love. And uh, of course, um, sexual in copulation, intercourse in married, with married people. So, and I imagine the dictionary.com doesn't probably make that distinction, but. Uh, but it's a very, it, it's, it's just a love that's on the human level. And love on the human level is not eternal. The love of God is eternal. And during today's sermon, we're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians 13 and just stop and think about how God <clears throat> describes love. How he, what he says about love. And the thing about the love of God is it's poured out in our hearts is that we can never take credit for it. We cannot say this kind of love comes from me. It's because I'm a nice person. It's God inside us who is transforming us and the glory all goes to him. So, because he lives inside us, his love begins to transpire as we participate in what he's doing in our lives. And that is important to, to realize because a lot of times we can take credit and say, well, and begin to compare ourselves and with others and he's more loving than I am and I'm more loving than he is or she is and all of that. Well, the love of God is the love of God. <laughs> And he works with people who are at different level of development, if you will. And as we participate with him, we, we grow. And, and, and this love of God is never imposed. It's always expressed in freedom. God does not force us to express his love towards other people. It's a choice that we make as we participate. We are, as, as he pours out his love, Inside us, we, we are still very distinct from God. And we have the freedom to express his love or not. Because that is what love is. It cannot be imposed. It comes from the heart. So it becomes the love of God as he transforms us becomes a way of being. And it's reflected in our actions. Our actions towards God and our actions towards one another, those in the faith and those outside the faith. And Paul says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a, chain, a, a clanging cymbal. And you see, Paul is not denying the gift of tongues here. But he has to correct the Corinthians because the Corinthians 
were placing tongues above everything else. <laughs> he, they were placing tongues, the gift of tongues above prophecy, above, above love. And Paul sets things straight in because he says love is of first importance. He is very clear about it because he, sim he, he clearly says that without love, speaking in tongue is simply worthless. Absolutely worthless. It's just a, a, a noise-making machine. That's all that is. It's not glorifying God and it's not edifying neighbor without love. The, in Corinthians 14, Paul tell, tells them that he spoke in tongues more than all of them. So he's not denying that gift of tongue, but he's placing it in, in its proper place as well. I like the way uh, Karl Barth says it in his commentary on 1 Corinthians in Church Dogmatics, Volume 4.2, uh, on page 830, he says, The sound of a bell or a gong is not music. It is simply a noise. And so, too, is speaking with tongues without love, no matter how significant and, and arresting it may sound or how seriously it may have God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in intention. If it is without love, its good intentions is no more value than the spiritual wealth which seeks expression in it. And he says, what sounds in it is only the exalted self-enjoyment and the forceful self-expression of the one who speaks with tongues, and it is something which is monotonous, tedious, uninspiring, and finally irksome and annoying. And I don't know if you've ever been in situations where a tongue is spoken, and uh, I have, and, me, and, and where it is, sometimes when, when it's done without love, and I can't judge people's heart, it's, it's, it's up to them, but I did not understand at all what they were saying. To me it did not have it absolutely, it didn't have any significance, it was just a babble to me. And in 1 Corinthians he goes on to say that if there's no one to interpret what you're saying, then you should keep it to yourself. <laughs> because then it's not edifying to anybody else. And so, but Paul is not denying that it is a gift. And I have known people who were praying in tongues in their private prayers and not imposing it on others and not displaying it in the church or anything like that. They were, they had that gift and they felt inspired by it. But if it's expressed in, in the church and it's done for just a show of spirituality, and sometimes, you know, there are some people who say, well, if you can't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian. Well, the Bible doesn't say that at all. What's important is because God gives different gifts to different people. And not all have the gifts of teaching and not have the gift of all edification and, and all the other gifts that are named in, 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 in the Bible. It's God gifts as he wants to for the well-being and the edification of the body. That's how God works. So to say such things, and, and uh, it's uh, to give it undue worth is not what Paul is saying. It's falling into the mistake of the Corinthians. Prophetic powers and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge can also be worthless. Again, Paul is not diminishing the value of prophets. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, 29 and Ephesians 4, 11, Paul names the Christian prophets right after the apostles. So he's not denying that. He's simply saying that without love, all these activities are worth zero, nothing. 
That's what they're worth. They make us nothing. Because Paul says you are nothing. He says very clearly that it's possible to do these impressive activities and yet that these activities be done without the love of God. They're just idle words and idle activities. And so we have examples of that in the Old Testament as well. When Jeremiah, he had some, some prophets uh, who were going against Jeremiah. They were prophesizing sweet things. And Jeremiah was the only one talking about or reflecting what God was saying. And he corrected them and he rejected Jeremiah for it. In Matthew 7.22, he says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then he goes on to say, I, didn't, I don't know you. God says. Because if it's done on the human level and it's done for selfish purposes and self aggrandizement and impre to impress people, it's not worth anything. Karl Barth says on page 831, says, we are reminded of Matthew 7.22, which tells us that we may speak as prophets or cast out demons or do many mighty works in the name of Jesus, and yet to do that which is against God and therefore belongs to those whom he has never known. It is love alone that counts and not his brilliance however great it may be within the, this limit. So people can say very impressive things, but if it's not, it's without love and it's outside the obedience of God, then God says, you're not, it's not worth anything because you're not, it's not connected to me, basically. And Jesus uses very strong words that I, they have never been known. These are the words of God. These are not my own. So, and even giving all and the ultimate self-sacrifice are worth nothing without love. Again, actions which are just made to attract attention to oneself in other words, out of self-love, have no eternal value. Because the love of God, the love that we express has to be sourced in God, who is love. That kind of love is the only one which is not limited love, that is eternal love. And as God's people, we might say, well, you know, how do I know that I'm in, in that I'm expressing the love of God. Well, God tells us that we are to obey His commandments, that we react in His grace to obeying His commandments, that we, that we are passionate for Him, and that we love neighbor. And also God tells us, as we are bonded and united to Jesus, we are told to rest. So it's a question of faith as well that the love of God is poured out in our hearts and we trust that God is doing it and he's giving us the strength to react to his love. Because, you know, if we were always to second guess ourselves, then we look to us and we always have to look to God who tells us, you know, come to me and I'll give you rest. You are heavily burdened. He also tells us Jesus is working. So the love of God is not a passive kind of love. It's not a passive ex participating in what God is doing. He's not, it's not a passive in that we do nothing and say, well, God, you do it all. You love through me, and I'm just going to sit in my chair and do nothing. <laughs> that doesn't work either. We have to express it in participating in what God is doing. The glory goes to God, but... You know, we, as we read these things, we can have a guilt trip and say, well, I'm not loving as much as I am. And we're not. In reality, 
will only be very completely loving at the resurrection we're completely transformed we're still sinners we still sin we don't leave, live to the level of, of God but that does not excuse the fact that we are to participate in the love in the love of God in the expression of the love of God so I just wanted to make that clarification so that we don't leave the sermon saying you know the true I don't love the true measurement is Jesus and he's living in us and he's giving his love and we God has called us what to be living sacrifices so we are called to give ourselves to God completely and just surrender to him with his help and he is the one who transforms us we don't transform ourselves God is doing the transformation so this kind of love that is described here is very strong love it's victorious love it conquers everything because it's the love of God in us it conquers it's it's going to to live for eternity it's not temporal in Galatians 5 6 he says for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love so we have faith and our, our the faith that we have in God works through love through the love of God that's poured out in our hearts so love has staying power love is long-suffering and we are to love our brothers and sisters in the faith and we are to love all people as we are told in first Thessalonians 3 12 but there's a special kind of bond in those people that God is calling now and that bond is solidified by Jesus himself we are united with him he's the head of the body we are made a part of a part of that body with the special giving gifting that God gives us and it stands on solid ground because it's rooted in the rock in Jesus Karl Barth says a man is kind when he has freedom the ability to be spontaneously good to another a voluntary friend of God and therefore of men I'll just read that again because it's well said it says a man is kind when he has the freedom the ability to be spontaneously good to another and a voluntary friend to God and therefore of men so it's not something that it's part it becomes part of us God God is transforming us so it's not something that you know I'm loving one day and not loving the other it's it, as we grow in Christ it, be, it becomes part of our personality towards other people towards God towards other people as we react to him so it's not something that we do occasionally it's something that we do every day as we as we live in him nothing can destroy this kind of love all the forces of evil could not destroy the love of God expressed in Jesus Christ human beings express their hatred their venom towards Jesus the evil powers the demonic spirit beings as well and nothing could destroy the love of God nothing Jesus triumphed over them all he conquered over the second death because Jesus died he died the second death for us so that we could have eternal life nothing can destroy the universal church of Jesus because the universal church of Jesus is not bonded in hatred it's not bonded in animosity 
it's bonded in Jesus, who is love. We are united to him, so nothing can destroy that kind of love. And that's why the church of Jesus is still alive today. It'll never die. Whatever men try to, to, to kill it, it will never, because of this very strong bond that exists, united to Christ and united to one another. So it should be very encouraging for all of us, because even if we face the storms of life, and sometimes the storms are bigger than others, you know, we are not to abandon ship. We are to keep our eyes focused on Christ and saying, mm, you know, I belong to an organization, I belong to God, and His church will never die. It will continue. I'm safe here, even if the, the terrain around us is shaky. There's something, there's somebody stronger looking after His church than all the opposition or difficulties of this world. And he describes it, he says, love is patient and kind, it does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant. And that meaning of, of, of patience in the strong concordance, it says, it is it says to be a long spirit, not to lose heart. To persevere patiently and bravely in enduring misfortunes and troubles. The, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience. Some of the translations have long suffering. So it endures in troubles, it endures in difficulties. That love of God that he has given us. To be patient in bearing the offenses and the injuries of others. To be mild and slow in avenging. Again, we bear the offenses of others. We are not shaken in our love for God and for neighbors because other human beings are weak or fellow, fellow Christians are weak. We just stay steadfast because of the indwelling Holy Spirit in us. It's to be mild and slow in avenging. In fact, God tells us never to avenge ourselves, but to leave the avenging to Him. That's what He tells us very clearly in Romans. To be long-suffering, slow to anger, and slow to punish are the definition of, uh, that, we, that we find in, in the strong concordance. And love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. So again, the love of God is superior to us, God, because it's give, God has given it to us. And we are not to brag about how loving we are. <laughs> not say, well, you know, I'm a, such a loving person, such a... No, because the, then the glory goes to us. But it's not really, uh, it's, it's God in us, and the glory, God is the source. And I like what Solomon said in Proverbs, and I imagine you'll like it too, because it's God's word, you're inspired by God. So it says, let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Proverbs 27.2. So it's okay for you know, your friend or your husband or wife to shower you with praises. And you just say, thank you. Thank you, God, that you're working these things in your heart. And I appreciate however you respond. But it's not, you, you let the others see the fruit of, God's, of God in your life. And uh, in Proverbs 25, 7, it says, It's not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. So it's interesting that he puts both, you know, eating too much honey <laughs> will give you a heartache. And I guess seeking one's glory gives you a big head. 
and just turns other people off as well, and it's not very very loving. So, but it's a it's a problem. And as human beings, we want to be recognized. We want to say to be patted on the back. But that's rooted in the self, rooted in God. We realize that it comes from Him. So, whether people recognize it or not, it's it's okay because some people will not. Karl Barth says. The same book on page 833 says, Even as one who speaks with tongues, or as a prophet, or as a theologian, or a miracle worker, or as an ascetic or martyr, he can still envy, still covet rights and honor, and the recognition he deserves, and their clear-cut success for his action. For if he loves, there is no place for envy, and in the fact that this is so, love conquers. So it basically means that, you know, I could give all my money to the poor and wish for the Times and Transcript and National Post and to be recognized by the general, by the Governor General of Canada. If that is my intention, it's worth nothing. It's worth nothing. So what God, basically God says. Even if I give my life in the hope that I'll be remembered by other human beings for all eternity for what I've done. It's worth nothing if it's without love. And again, it's the love of God. The credit goes to God. And it's our worst enemy is ourselves, really, because that's a, a human tendency that we have, that we want to give glory to ourselves. We want to be recognized. We want to be patted on the back. We get hurt when we don't. But God is helping us to conquer that through His love. Whether people recognize it or not, we still express love. And Paul boasted. Paul bragged, but how did Paul brag? In 2 Corinthians 10.13 he says, But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regards to the area of influence God assigned to us, and to reach even to you. So, and there are, very, there are various places where Paul talks about boasting in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians one thirty one. he says, Therefore, as it is written, let no one, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Be thankful that we are in the Lord. Now, it doesn't, God doesn't, God doesn't tell us, you know, he has given us talents and gifts. He is not telling us to not recognize them. If we boast in the Lord, it means that the glory goes to God and we realize that these gifts are coming from God and not from us. They're not manufactured by us. And there's, there's a balance. There's, that's where the balance comes in. But love does not try to impose itself on others, it doesn't try to have its own way. We are able to leave others room to grow as God is working with them. As he helps them to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. And as human beings, we tend to be impatient. We tend to say, well, that person should grow up. That person should be better. That person should not act that way. That person should be more loving or whatever. We can encourage them, but we, we, we are not to impose our ways on them. It is God's work. It is, it is him who transforms, not us. It is not ir irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And this verse goes to the core of relationships, doesn't it? Because love is described in the face of difficulties, both in us 
and with other people. When a lot of the conflicts that we have are due to the expe expectations that we have of other people, so we might be less upset with people who are not in the faith because our expectations of them is not as high. But we may be upset with people in the faith because our expectations are higher for them. And so we may get upset at them. They're not, they're not functioning as they should. And when our expectations are high, then people get on, can get on our sensitive nerve, if you will. And we all have a different sensitive nerve. We all have one. You know, sometimes, you know, people will do things and we get irritated, we get upset. Because we are human. But we need to realize that I am human, you are human, and I have to allow for weaknesses and not get super upset because you have weaknesses. With God's love, I still need to love you, and you still need to love me with all my weaknesses as God's people with the love of God. But when somebody touches the sensitive nerve, it causes a real battle for us, doesn't it? When somebody tells me something, or tells you something, or tells us something that is really irritating, it begins to take all our emotional energy, doesn't it? We begin to focus on that. We begin to see all the flaws that the, that other person has because it's, all, it's a lot easier to see the flaws in other people than in ourselves. That's what Jesus tells us. So it not only gets into our emotions, it gets into our thinking and into our whole body. Every, we all become, we, we become aroused in our whole body. And when, this, some, that, that when that happens, we can even become so angry, we can become, we can become enraged and have a fit as human beings. <laughs> you know? And God is telling us, mm, how do I love that other person as God has loved me? With God's help. Karl Barth says, the Christian cannot become an antagonist to, of his neighbor. Love neither has nor cherishes nor tolerates any anti-complexes. This is one of the secrets of the superiority, it's victory. So basically he's saying, you know, as God's people, we are not to be known for what we are against or who we are against. Because we are to be, we are to, as forgiving people, it means that we don't carry a little book with all the mistakes of all the other people have done for us. And we have a memory, don't we? So it takes God loves to be able to overcome that. And because when we when somebody gets into our nerves, sensitive nerves, we can get bitter, we can get resentful. And Hebrews twelve fifteen tells us, see that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and that by it many become defiled. Because when we become angry, it's easy to talk about other people in a very negative way. See what that whoever did to me. The, I like uh, the way the message says it. It says, make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp, a sharp eye out, of, out for weeds of bitter discontent. A thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. We have, on the side of our lawn, we have creeping charlies. And, uh, you know, so these creeping charlies, they have a tendency to be so invasive that they'll just take over everything. And it's a little bit like bitterness. You know, if you, if you let it go, it's, it can poison everybody. It can, because... Usually people who are bitter want to talk about it to other people. They have difficulty keeping it to, their, to themselves. They just... And we're, we're human. 
And God says, you know, don't let, don't let that overtake you. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. So God helps us to have self-control, to, to realize, hey, that person is loved by God. How, I, how can I react to him in a way that is godly? And it doesn't mean that we're wimps or anything like that because it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to be able to react to other people with the love of God. And we grow in that as he, God lives in us. The way God forgives, and it's, it's a good reminder not to keep a ledger book of other people's mistakes. And it's a lot easier to keep a ledger book of other people's mistake with people who are very close to us, like family members, like church members, like friends. But God says in Psalm, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. Peter thought he was a very forgiving guy. <laughs> he said, but if we walk in the light, um, he says, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We are cleansed from all sins. So how can we hold sins against another person and keep a ledger? Again, Peter thought he was a very forgiving person. He said, you know, if we forgive seven times seven, the transgressors, the transgressors of our brother, is that okay? And Jesus said, no, no, it's not, it's not it. It's 70 times seven. So we need to keep on forgiving. If you look at the legal system, they keep a very close count. If you ever break the law and you have problems with the law, they'll forever keep your sins in the books. As God's people, we are to be different because the love of God covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't mean that we, you know, depending on the type of relationship we are in, it doesn't mean that we tolerate somebody abusing us or anything like that. We have, God has given us wisdom. But we're talking about a forgiving spirit. A forgiving spirit that God talks about. And in God's economy, love covers a multitude of sin. It covers my sin. He covers all of yours. And he wants us to extend that generosity to other people as he lives in us. So we'll continue from there next week. And we can, uh, we can certainly pray as we come to the end of the sermon and let us pray. Thank you that you have adopted us as your children and that you are transforming us in the image of your son because we are sinful human beings and yet you have given us your righteousness you have given us your sanctification you have given us you have made us right before you God in Christ what an enormous gift and father we don't want to just have lip service and our hearts be far from you transform us so that our lips and our hearts will reflect you in our whole being, will reflect you in our lives as we face. Make us, help us to be gracious, to be merciful, to be forgiving. Help us to understand how deep and how loving is your love for us. And help us to extend that deep love to other people because that deep love is you living in us. We ask, Father, that we would be the kind of ground that would produce fruit to the hundredfold with your presence in us. Help us to participate voluntarily in you to express 
your love to other people as we are joined and united to Christ. We don't always understand how you work, but we, we trust that you do. We trust that you live in us. We trust that you'll open our eyes to be able to live out of that kind of life, to live of love and to live out of your life as we live in this world. Help us, Father, to be passionate about other people and to have the profound desire that they will also come to know you one day. And help us to love one another as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.